Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, workshop on small area estimation. Uh, this workshop was jointly organized between uh, three organizations, ESCO, IFS, and CMAP. Um, there's been growing awareness that uh, we're interested in inequality and outcomes at the geographic level. This is more, more importantly than differences across regions, can be differences within regions. And increasingly, we have the data to look at the techniques to be able to look at those, those kind of fine grade differences. And that's what this conference is about. It's great to welcome you all here. Um, so there's not much housekeeping to do. Um, uh, so there's three sessions. After the last session, we will be going to the pub, to the College Arm, which is just around the corner, if you guys can join us for, for a drink. Uh, you get out the way you came in. Uh, and we also should thank both the, the Sarah, Sarah Woodcock and Sarah Shepherd from Mesco for uh, doing all the work uh, putting this conference together. Uh, the conference is going to be recorded. We don't, we've got one person uh, presenting via Zoom, but there aren't virtual attendees. The conference may be, uh, well, is going to be recorded, so your questions uh, uh, will be recorded as well. Um, Okay, and, and so without further ado, we can move on to the first uh, session. So the first presentation is by uh, Isabel Molina. Um, and uh, I should just check. Uh, Ray, can you, uh, can you hear and see everything? Yes, I can. Uh, I'll leave my, do you want me to start my video or I'll leave it off? Uh, uh, um, it's probably best to leave it off. Just okay. okay. I can definitely hear everything and I can see Isabel. Hello, Isabel. Hello, okay. Ray. I don't see you. <laughs> but I thought I would see you. But... Okay. Okay. Later. Okay. We've got 40 minutes. We'll try and we'll try not... five minutes in the presentation. Questions are going to be five minutes morning. Uh, it's not. I'll uh, you just need to click once into the. Into. into... Oh, okay. And then you should work. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, first I would like to thank for the invitation, for the kind invitation and for the organization of the event to the three institutions, and especially to Martin um, uh, and the two Saras who arranged everything for me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to come back to England, where uh, I uh, started seriously working in small area estimation 20 years ago, actually. I was actually visiting uh, Ray Chambers. So I was expecting to meet him here. It's a pity. So do you remember Ray? Uh, uh, I have to unmute for that. Yes, I do, Isabel. Yes, I do. <laughs> OK, so, so this talk is a compilation of recent advances in the estimation of, uh, in a smaller estimation of uh, general um, possibly non-linear indicators uh, based uh, and possibly several indicators based on a single uh, model for unit level data, for micro data, okay? Uh, let me start with, uh, with an illustration of the problem. Um, this uh, is an example on estimation of at risk of poverty rates in Spain. Uh, the data is from the survey on income and living conditions in, uh, from year 2006. Uh, it's all data set, but actually uh, the results are similar to those in the last survey in Spain. So we have improved and then we came back to, <laughs> to the same uh, figures. Uh, the, the sample size at that year was over 34,000 uh, persons out of the Spanish population at that time, which was over 43 million. Uh, the indicator of interest is at risk of poverty rate. The poverty line, as defined by Eurostat, is 60% of the median of the annual disposable equivalent income. In that year, it was exactly um, 6,557 euros. And with that poverty line, so a person who has an income uh, is annual disposable equivalent income below that quantity is at risk of poverty. It's regarded as at risk of poverty in the, in the language of the official statistics. And with that poverty line, approximately 20% of the uh, Spanish population 
uh, where at risk of poverty, uh, this estimate is based on that survey on with very large uh, sample size, as you can see. So that estimate is quite precise, but as soon as you disaggregate by location, uh, let's say by the 52 Spanish provinces and further by gender, then you end up with uh, pretty small sample sizes. Here I am showing in this table the crossings between province and gender with the sample size, with the smallest sample size, the largest, and the sample size is closest to first quartile, medium, and third quartile. Okay, and as you can see, only 17 women were, were interviewed in Soria, in a province called Soria, which is up north of Madrid. Okay, so uh, as you can. <laughs> Imagine uh, we cannot give a serious estimate of uh, a risk of poverty rate with 17 observations, okay? Actually, uh, we need to check how many are at risk of poverty, okay? And we got six, but you know, uh, by chance we could have obtained zero, okay? That's not reasonable, as we all agree, I think. Uh, so uh, we call uh, direct estimators to those that are based only on the area-specific data, on the data from the target area. <coughs> and uh, the direct estimator uh, for those uh, crossings, province gender, actually for that, uh, uh, for Soria women, um, has a, an estimated CV, relative error, exceeding uh, 50%, which is not acceptable at all. <coughs> Even for the crossing between province and gender in, in the, uh, with sample size in the first quartile, you can see uh, we get a relative error uh, exceeding 20%, which is not acceptable also. So at least for a quarter of the areas, that's, uh, I mean, the, these direct estimators are not useful in this case because of the small sample sizes. Um, so, uh, actually, uh, um, yeah. um, well, direct estimates are great when you estimate uh, with large sample sizes because they don't assume any kind of model, okay, they are non-parametric, uh, but they have this problem of inefficiency when the sample size is too small, so that's the problem. Uh, I am showing here in the last column uh, estimates that I'm going to describe in a while, they are called empirical best estimates that are based in a model, model-based estimators, okay, uh, <clears throat> based on a, a model for unit level data. And as you can see, uh, we can, uh, we decrease the relative error uh, substantially, okay, and especially uh, for the uh, domains uh, where the sample sizes were, uh, are smaller, okay? Uh, actually, in this example, they, uh, they got uh, smaller CVs for all, all the crossings, uh, province and um, Even, you see, even in the one with the largest sample size, okay? So I will describe this uh, procedure in a while. It's uh, the procedure that uh, we proposed, I proposed with uh, Professor uh, Jane Guerrao in a paper in 2010, in the Canadian Journal of Statistics. Okay, um, I need to describe the setup in which we work in a small area estimation, uh, which inherits uh, the setup from uh, the survey sampling theory, okay? So we work under pilot populations. U is a finite population of size cap L and is assumed to be partitioned into cap D subpopulations, U1, U cap D <coughs> of sizes, population sizes N1 and cap D uh, that I will uh, call indistinctly uh, domains or areas. Um, YBJ is the outcome for unit J within area D. And yd bold will be the vector with all these outcomes for all the units in the same area D, okay? And then uh, the target quantities in this presentation are uh, whatever functions of this vector yd, okay? Uh, general functions, delta D, 
uh, which could be linear functions such as area means, it's a linear function of winding, uh, adding and dividing mind, or nonlinear uh, functions. Okay, uh, examples of nonlinear indicators of uh, special interest are poverty and inequality indicators. I'm going to uh, describe just for illustration a family of uh, poverty indicators proposed by Foster, Green, and Thornberg. Okay, uh, but as I am describing here, uh, the, this talk is for general indicators, not only those. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this family is quite interesting because it contains uh, several indicators that are uh, estimated uh, often uh, by uh, of national statistical institutes or the World Bank or other organizations. Okay. So here EDJ is a welfare measure for individual J nom D. Uh, Z is poverty line, and the F A, well, this is a family of indicators uh, depending on a parameter alpha or different values of alpha, you get a different poverty indicator, okay? And alpha is non-negative. So for uh, uh, the, the poverty indicator for the alpha for domain D is just a mean, also mean of these variables, and these variables are uh, uh, this uh, product of these two factors, this factor is just an indicator function um, taking value one when the welfare of individual J is below the poverty line, so when the, person's, the person is at risk of poverty, and zero otherwise. And then we have this factor to the power alpha, alpha can be zero, can be zero, so when alpha is zero, that's one, and what we get when replacing this F alpha DJ and what we get is a proportion of people we think on below the poverty line, which is the at risk of poverty rate or poverty incidence. Um, for alpha one, what we get here is how much below the poverty line is the person's income relative to the poverty line, and when taking average, that's the poverty line. Okay, these two indicators are very often estimated. Uh, for example, by the World Bank. Um, okay, TRS denotes a sample down of size small n down from the population U. SD is a subsample from the main D of size small n D. And CD will be the complement of the sample, sample complement from the main D. And as I said, a direct estimator is an estimator based on the uh, ND observations from that, from the area need. And, uh, but these direct estimators are usually uh, based on the uh, surveys and the uh, sampling design. So uh, they um, typically, they have good properties across all the possible samples. Samples are sets of units that you can draw from, the, uh, from a finite population with a given uh, sampling design. So, uh, um, you know, often uh, surveys are not, uh, the, the, the design of the survey is not a simple random sampling, and often uh, individuals have different probabilities of being included in the sample, and you need to account for that. So, imagine that, uh, I don't know, richer people have larger probability of being in the sample, then you need to downweight them, okay? And you need to upweight those with the uh, uh, with less probability of appearing in the sample. That's the idea of the horvitz thompson estimator, which is the um, um, the unbiased estimator under the sampling design when uh, for general uh, sampling designs with different uh, probabilities of being included in the sample. Okay, so that's PDI is the probability of being of individual I being in the sample, uh, you define the weights as the uh, reciprocals and you weight the individuals with these weights. Okay, uh, for simple random sampling within the area, what you get is the usual sample mean. Okay, uh, so uh, the problem with direct estimators is that they are highly inefficient, as we have seen, for uh, a small sample size and mean. So we need to appeal to what we call indirect estimators that use also data from out of the area, 
out of this target area. How to do that? You need to establish some kind of relationship between the areas, okay? Uh, so there's assumptions. So, <laughs> you know, in the statistics, uh, we supply the lack of data with assumptions. <laughs> okay, you need to be able to check the assumptions. That's very important. I'm always insisting every time I give a talk. Okay, you need to to be uh, you need to check the assumptions with the data. Okay, so um, so these uh, indirect estimators borrow stress from other areas by making some kind of homogeneity assumption across areas. Um, uh, particular uh, subset of in the indirect estimators are model-based estimators that assume a model that links all the areas. A model, let's say, for income in terms of several auxiliary variables, let's say, uh, years of uh, studies, uh, whatever. Okay, and, uh, and you assume some uh, common parameter, that's the clue. You need common parameter for all of the areas, okay? Um, that's the most, probably the most, uh, most popular uh, model uh, um, using um, unilevel data. It was proposed by Batiste Harten and Fuller in 1988, and uh, they assumed that the outcome is linearly related to a set of auxiliary variables with this, you see, the common beta for all the areas. Beta does not have the area index D, the domain index D. So it's constant for all of the areas, but that's not uh, good enough. It's okay, but it's not perfect. Because as you can imagine, there might be unexplained uh, heterogeneity between the areas, okay? Some uh, differences in the income that are not fully uh, accounted for by the uh, viable auxiliary information. So you need to include in the model, uh, uh, that's what we call area effects, okay? Area effects, and these are the usual assumptions in the uh, simplest model, okay? These are the unit level errors and area effects and uh, assume to be uh, normally, I, I be normally distributed with zero mean and constant variance and independent one of the other also. Um, so uh, here the clue is that uh, we have common parameters for all the areas, beta and the two variances that are estimated, that will be estimated with the whole survey, not only the survey data from the uh, target area, but the total, uh, okay, the overall survey data. So uh, this will allow to estimate in each of the areas with uh, much more efficiency, okay. Um, uh, this model, um, which was actually proposed under a completely different setup uh, in, in agriculture, and actually the auxiliary information uh, was taken from uh, satellite images. Now it's very fashionable to use satellite images. Everybody's, if you are not doing that, then you are, you are out of the. <laughs> okay. Uh, so back in 1988, they, st they started using uh, satellite images information for uh, uh, this application based on uh, estimating uh, crops of uh, soybeans and, and, um, and corn. Okay. Um, in 2003, Elbers, Lanjo, and Lanjo from the World Bank, they proposed a method um, called ELN procedure, very famous. Uh, and the, the beauty of the method was that was very general because, because this, this, this model was originally proposed for estimation only of area means, of means. One lack in econometrics also had a similar model for agricultural field effects in, back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. so okay. The same model. Okay. Well. <laughs> Everyone, I think we, we, science evolves very little, very little uh, every time. Yeah? Like we give very small steps. So we usually are based on previous work. Yeah. Um, okay, so Elvis Lanjo and Lanjo uh, propose a method uh, based on a very similar model, the same model, 
but instead of considering any effects here, they, they, uh, the, the, these effects, random effects, were for the uh, clusters, the uh, primary sampling units uh, of the sampling design. Okay, first stage units of the sampling design. So uh, they accounted for cl cluster effects, not area effects in their original uh, paper. Um, and the, uh, yeah, the uh, model responses were log of the welfare variable. Um, for simplicity here and, and for comparability, I will consider that the clusters are the same as the areas. Um, they proposed uh, an estimator based on a booster procedure that I am uh, briefly uh, outlining here very briefly, no details. Uh, uh, it was working as follows. You first feed the model, the, the model that we have seen before, to the survey data, obtaining estimates of the model parameters, okay, beta hat, sigma u hat. Then uh, they resample from, from the distribution, they have a distribution, okay, probability distribution. Um, and in this setup, it's not easy to derive the exact distribution. They did approximations to the distributions, estimated them, and then they resampled from the estimated approximate distributions. <laughs> resampled parameters, okay? Beta, sigma u, two stars, sigma e, uh, sigma e two. And from them, they generated from the model using those parameters, uh, they generated uh, a full census of the outcome variable, okay? By uh, drawing um, random effects from the, um, from the area level residuals and errors from the unit level residuals. Uh, and using the uh, generated parameters there, then you can generate uh, a full census of, okay? Then once you have the census, you can estimate whatever you want. That's great, okay? That was a good idea. Uh, so you can estimate your target parameter, which is a general function of the vector y d generated, uh, okay? And you can estimate several parameters at the same time, no problem, depending, several indicators depending on the same uh, variable input. Uh, and then you repeat steps two to four, a uh, large number of times B and take average of D of the true values of the true bootstrap uh, true values. Okay, that was the ELL estimate. That one, and then the variances, the variance, the variance across all the uh, B uh, generated uh, true values, variance of them, that was taken as noise measure. Okay. Um, this procedure has several problems that uh, from the beginning some uh, very important researchers uh, uh, were redesigned, including several Nobel Prizes. And um, these are, they just uh, did not <laughs> specifically uh, mention the problems, but in general words, they were, uh, they were uh, pointing out to the problems. Um, these are the problems. Um, just for understanding, um, if we don't re-estimate these model parameters, you keep them to the uh, original ones, okay? What you have here, this is a Monte Carlo average, which is approximating an expectation, okay? It's this is a Monte Carlo average, uh, approximating the marginal expectation of the indicator, delta D. Okay, um, imagine that my indicator is just the mean of the response variables of the outcomes. Okay, uh, perhaps you don't have a transformation, then it will be the mean of the welfare, the mean of income. Uh, then, if you take expectation of, the, of this, you see, finding population mean in the model, that's the model, you take, Finding one by cap n sum over j in on the units in the area, then you get the mean of x times beta plus ud 
is constant plus the mean of errors. Then you take expected value, what you get, what you get is x bar beta plus expected value of ud, which is zero. You see? It's zero. Plus expected value of errors is zero. So there's no area effect anymore. So the area effect goes for nothing in the model. Okay? That was the problem of PLA procedure. You see? Area effect uh, vanishes, you know, in this bootstrap procedure. It's for nothing. Okay? That's what is called a regression synthetic estimator. Uh, many people uh, apply uh, synthetic procedures. We call synthetic procedures to those that do not account for, uh, for the area effects, okay? For area heterogeneity that is not explained by your uh, auxiliary information. That is okay if you have all the factors that determine income, okay? Then that would be okay. But uh, you need to check for that. Uh, it's just a particular case. Uh, it's better to apply more general procedures that are performing well uh, in other situations where you don't have all the factors that determine uh, income, okay? Um, um, but there are other uh, problems. Look, if someone gave you the beta, Best case, some God gives you the true beta. Then this estimator, look, is not using at all the survey data. You know, it's very expensive, very difficult to get, and it's the only data on the real variable you want to measure, which is income. Okay? This estimator will not use for any of the areas the survey data, which is the precious data. <laughs> most important information that we have. Imagine that you want to estimate in areas in London, and, uh, sorry, in, uh, in, uh, in England, and one area is London, and you have 5,000 observations from the survey, we're very expensive to get. And then you, it's a waste of information, <laughs> okay? And actually the model, you are just using the model. The model is, a, is our invention, okay? It's an assumption. We are not sure if the model is correct. We cannot be sure. So that's dangerous, as you can see. And it's a waste of information. Um, uh, there was another problem also, uh, is the following. You see this variance, um, this variance is not estimating correctly the true mean squared error, which is here uh, what we should estimate. Why? Look, mean square error is the expected value of the uh, square of prediction error here. Uh, but here, delta D, delta D is function of the outcomes in area D, and these outcomes are random, okay? So delta D, the target parameter, is random. And, okay, it's a random quantity. This means, you see, this expectation of the square, would be, you can decompose it, no? As, as a variance of the prediction error plus the square of the bias. Even if your estimator was unbiased, you still have variance of prediction error, not of the estimator, because this is also random delta D. So that was another. Well, good morning, everybody. Good evening from Wollongong. Uh, I hope you can all hear me, otherwise I suppose Peter will tell me. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers of today's workshop on small area estimation for asking me to present some of my recent research uh, on this topic. Unfortunately, I can't be at the seminar today um, because I could not travel to the UK in August as I had originally planned. But it's been possible to organize this Zoom presentation and I hope it will suffice. I would also like to acknowledge my co-authors, Nicola Salvati, from the University of Pisa and Enrico Fabrizi from the Catholic University of Milan for their help in developing the ideas that I will present. As you can see up on the screen, uh, I decided to slightly change the title of my talk to more accurately indicate what it's about. In effect, I'll be drawing on ideas from three areas of statistical methods in this presentation 
in order to address an important emerging area of small area estimation application, the area that was SAE based on integrated data sources. Okay, so linkage errors, missing information, and small area estimation. The talk itself is basically in three parts, and that's the three parts are up there. Okay, so can I? No, I can't. Okay, let's try. Ah, here we are. Uh, it's working now. Is it okay, possible data to, to full screen as well? If you just control L, maybe. Maybe. Uh, usually, what happens is nothing works when you do that. But I'm willing to try. Okay, hasn't worked. Yeah, it's it's fine. <laughs> now there it is. I hope it'll keep working. Okay. Yeah. Um, but no, let me see if it jumps. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so data integration via record linkage. Uh, record linkage, most of you will be aware, is a strategy for gathering information about the same individual or population unit by combining data from two or more distinct sources. Um, I'm going to take, um, typically these, this linkage is done using common values of key variables, usually referred to as matching variables. I'm going to take a secondary analyst perspective on the whole thing. Uh, so I don't have access to the matching variables, which is often the case, for example, of trusted third party data linkage is used. Now, data linkage is now very widely used. Uh, for example, in the UK, uh, the NHS has something which calls the Open Safely Analytics Platform, which effectively provides a linked data spine from all its patient data. Uh, and this uh, access to this resource was used to provide very important insights into risk factors associated with COVID uh, during the early stages of the pandemic. So we can see that you know this this is this is something that's getting quite important. But record linkage is not perfect. Linked data are not single source data. We're integrating two or more distinct data sources. Measure, measurement errors can arise because the data is held on contributing sources are not precisely the data that would have been collected from a single study. They often are proxies. Not all records in the different sources can be linked. Mislinks are common, never mentioned, of course, but they're common. Uh, uh, so there are some issues there, but the issue I'm going to focus on is linkage error. Not all matches identified by the linkage processes are correct. This may be because unique identifiers may not exist or may contain errors, or, or it may not be possible to do uh, to get these error-free unique identifiers. In which case, often what is turned to here is probabilistic or non-deterministic data linkage. Uh, and so effectively records are linked if it's highly likely that in fact they both came from the same individual. Uh, so just to give you some idea of the potential for error here, I'm going back to 1998 here. This is a study using West Australian data linkage unit data. They recorded linkage errors of around about 10% or correct linkage rates of around about 90% uh, for, a, for work that had been done uh, over 96, 97. They go back a little bit earlier, uh, this correct linkage rate dropped down to between 75 and 85%. Uh, and these rates by are for situations where name and address identifiers were available. So we still had linkage errors. Now, there have been recent improvements in machine learning based linkage, and that should certainly improve correct linkage rates, but we're unlikely ever to achieve error-free linkage in practice. Okay, so what happens with linkage errors is we get bias. There's attenuation of effects, uh, which are the, if, due to linkage errors that leads to bias when the linked data are used to fit statistical models, which relate to the correctly linked data. So statistical uh, methods, standard estimation methods, for example, OLS need to be modified. And work's been done on, on, on those modifications, uh, going back now quite a while as well. Original work, Shuren and Wilker, uh, Winkler in 1993, more recently, Lahiri and Larson in 2005, and most recently, Slavsky et al. in 2021. The trouble with linkage errors is they can be confounded with other model errors. So there's an increased likelihood of models misspecification. For example, linkage errors can lead to outliers in the linked data. Okay, and these outliers are not representative, they're not true values. So that can lead to biases, even when modern outlier robust estimation methods are used. So Raymond, just to check, we're on slide two. Is that where you are? 
No, I thought that would be happening. No, it, no, I've gone way past slide two. That's the trouble with the full screen. Um, yeah, sorry, guys. Nobody yelled. So um, I will try and get out a full screen if I can. Uh, yeah, it's my fault. Uh, that gets out. Okay, now out of full screen, uh, you'll have a little bit of stuff around there, but at least things will move. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly go back. This is the stuff I just talked about. <laughs> that was two. <laughs> that was three. There's four. And there's five. And now we have a picture, which is fairly... It's working now, sorry. <laughs> okay, so is it working? Yeah, it's fine. It's, it's all, all right, okay. okay. Um, simulated data here shows true values, which are the black dots. The outliers, they're the black triangles. You can see them there. But the linkage errors are the interesting ones. They're the red circles. And you can see if you were faced with this data set, you would be hard pressed to tell the difference between an outlier and a linkage error. So you can see how these things, these two sources of error can interact with one another and lead to biases, increased variability, uh, inefficient inference. Okay, so let's get started on some notation and assumptions. I'm gonna focus on regression modeling using data from two linked population registers, easiest thing to do. I'm gonna have a Y register, which has my target variable on it. I'm going to have an X register, which has my covariates on it. Okay, the records in the linked data set are denoted by Y star and X. I'm going to assume that my linked data are ordered in the same way as my X register. And Y star is the linked value corresponding to the true value Y. It's not the true value Y. It's the, the thing I think is the true value Y, but may not be. Okay, and we have a sample of records from this linked register, which is released for analysis. Now, moving on, I'm going to assume that both registers have complete coverage of the same population with no duplicates. Big assumption, but we've got to start somewhere. Okay. The other thing I'm going to assume is the linked register includes a set of what are called blocking variables, non-unique identifiers, which can be used to partition it into Q subgroups or blocks with each block consisting of the records for a certain number of individuals. The thing about these blocks is they, they constitute our assumption that there can be no between blocks linkage errors. So we, we are partitioning the population into, into groups such that linkage error is confined to each of these groups or blocks. So the true value of Y corresponding to a Y star or a linked value in a block can never be the Y value for a record from another block. The other big assumption we'll be making is mutual non-informativeness. I'm going to assume that sample outcomes are sampling process, the linkage outcomes, what happens when we link the data, and the regression error outcomes are all mutually independent given our covariates. Okay, so that's not an unreasonable assumption. We typically make the assumption that sample and, and model errors are mutually uh, non-informative. I'm adding linkage outcomes into that mix. So that, that implies that sampling from Y and linking to X is stochastically equivalent to complete and one-to-one -one linkage of X and Y followed by sampling from the link register. So sample then link is stochastically equivalent to link then sample. This sounds okay, but it has an important implication. The important implication here is that the information used in linkage has to be the same for both linkage sampling and sampling linkage. If that's not the case, if you just directly link from a sample to a, to a register, then the non-informative assumption will be violated, okay? Because there's not as much information available for that matching process. Okay, as I said, I was gonna take a secondary ana analyst perspective. Uh, I'm gonna assume I have individual link sample uh, values in a uh, block. Y star and X. Uh, I may also have some other information uh, for that uh, from the link register. For example, I may in fact, I, I may just have the block averages uh, of the covariates from X. I may in fact sometimes have the actual block averages for Y as well, because it comes out of the link register. Now, because of the assumption of one-to-one -one and complete linkage, it's easy to see that the block average of Y star and the block average of Y are exactly the same. Okay, so that, that's easy to see, and it can be useful at times to know that. We, sometimes we will have linkage paradata. This is information about linkage accuracy, the LAMP, the, the, the probability of a correct linkage. 
Okay, maybe you have an audit subsample, which we can use to check that out. Now we're gonna assume those data are available or provided to us. Uh, this paradata is provided to us by the linking organization. Now we have to model the linkage error. Now, basic assumption we have here is that most links within a block will be correct and incorrect links will occur randomly. So since linkage within a block is one-to-one -one and complete, we are able to write down Y star, which is the linked values in a block, equal to A times Y, which is the correct values in that block, where A is a latent random permutation matrix. Okay, and we have non-informative sampling. So effectively we can relate our linked sample data to the population values of Y in a block through the sample rows of A. Then the final thing we do is we put a model on A. And we call this model the exchangeable linkage error model. And it is a very simple model. It just says that within a block, all records have the same probability of being correctly linked and all records have the same probability of being incorrectly linked. Okay, and so you have this parameter lambda and another parameter eta, which is the probability of incorrect linkage, which is related to lambda as, as you can see over here. And you can show from that, that the expected value of A is then this function of lambda and eta, which I call T. And what we want to do is use that now to develop MLE for linked data and from then go on to small area estimation using linked data. Okay, slight move sideways here because we want to do MLE. I'm going to use the missing information principle to compute the MLEs. Now, I suspect most people in the audience will know the missing information principle, but I'll just quickly go through it just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, so likelihood-based inference using a messy observed data set, for example, a linked data set, is equivalent to likelihood-based inference using a much larger ideal data set when the maximum likelihood estimating functions defined by a model for the larger data set are replaced by the expected values given the messy uh, data values. It doesn't matter what the larger data set is. The only requirement is that the data we have is a subset of this larger set of data that we'd like to have. Okay, so we're going to, that's basically the, the idea behind the missing information principle, how we implement it. I'll show on the next page is we start with the two things. Well, the, the thing we use basically uh, in maximum likelihood uh, estimation is we basically solve uh, for look for a zero of the score function, which is the derivative of the log likelihood. And the maximum likelihood estimating equation is defined by setting the score function equal to zero. We also have the information function, uh, which is the negative of the derivative of the score. And the estimated variance of the MLE is then approximated by the inverse of the information evaluated at the MLE. Okay, now what the, ML, the missing information principle says, says two things. The first thing is the available data score, that's the score base of the fun, the score for the parameters of interest given the data we have, is the conditional expectation given these data of the ideal data score. That's what's written down here. So this is the uh, actual score function and it's the conditional expectation of the ideal score function given the observed data. The same thing goes for the information function, slightly more complicated. It's the, uh, the actual information we have is the expected expectation, a uh, conditional expectation of the ideal information minus the conditional variance of the ideal score. I've, I've written this thing here in, I'll put it in red because from an estimation perspective, this is the most important thing. If we want to do variances, mean squared errors, whatever you want, then this information becomes interesting. But there are many other ways we can do uh, 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 variances, for example, using a bootstrap. So in the, in, I will focus essentially on when I say the myth, I'll be referring to this first uh, sort of this first uh, equation up here. Okay, so now let's talk about data integration. Okay, so let's suppose we have a population U. We have values Y and X of two scalar variables stored on separate registers, each of size N. We take a sample S of N units from one register, which is linked to the other bar. We now have a unique common identifier. So this is not probabilistic uh, linking. So we have N matched y, y and X pairs. I want to use the linked sample data to estimate the parameters alpha, beta, and sigma squared 
just take that. Uh, I'll just assume I have some very simple uh, linear model over here where y is alpha plus beta x plus sigma times a, a Gaussian uh, variable uh, over there. Okay, so I'm going to assume uh, non-informative uh, sampling, and the naive MLEs for alpha, beta, and sigma squared are the usual OLS estimators. Now, if register average values of y and x are known, then we know something more when we have our sample data. We can then use the MIP to show that the MLEs for the parameters of the population regression model are identical to estimators defined by a weighted least squares fit to an extended sample consisting of our actual end data values and an additional, one additional data value with weight equal to the population size minus the sample size corresponding to the known non-sample means of Y and X. Remember, if we have this population means, we'll have the non-sample means. But what about when our data are not deterministically linked? The same situation with two linked registers, each of size n, the scalar real valued variable y defined uh, and a vector, vari vector valued variable x. Uh, there's no unique identifier. So linkage is non-deterministic. Now the sample data are now n linked pairs, y star and x, where y star is equal to y only if linkage is perfect. All right, we have no summary marginal information from y, but let's suppose we have population data from x. I'm going to use ELE, exchangeable linkage errors, to model the linkage error process. So I'm going to have a blocking variable. I'm going to assume one-to-one -one and complete linkage within blocks. A is, of course, still this unknown random permutation matrix. Uh, I have the ELE model, which says, okay, the expectation of A is equal to this T matrix over here, where lambda and eta, lambda is the probability of a correct link, and eta is the probability of an incorrect link. And I'm also going to assume linkage paradata are available, which means we are told, or can perhaps independently estimate, the values lambda cubed. Because once we have lambda, we have eta. Key assumption, as I said before, mutually independent linkage outcomes, sampling outcomes, and model errors. Okay, if you've got that, then, okay, my ideal data, obviously, is knowing the population, or the block in this case, now, ideally, my expected value of y given x, or my ideal, uh, the expectation of my ideal data is just x beta under the model I just gave you. But the expectation of my uh, linked data, on the other hand, uh, is under the ELE model, is going to be equal to t times x beta. So you have this t matrix coming in, pre-multiplying the covariate uh, matrix x. Similarly, with the variance uh, of, if the variance of y given x is, of course, sigma squared times the identity matrix, that's the ideal data. But with the linked data, you can show very simply that the variance of y star given x is sigma squared times an identity matrix plus an extra term, which reflects the, head, the increased variability, which is coming in from linkage errors. And this V matrix here is given by this expression. Okay, and you can also show that the covariance of y and y star is given by sigma squared times the uh, t primed. In order to apply the MIP, remember it's a conditional expectations we need to deal with. So we need the conditional distribution of the ideal data given the observed data. So marginal distributions of y given x and y star given x are easy to see. They've got to be Gaussian, but the joint is not since the support of Y star is Y. So we're not going to get full MLEs, but what we're going to do is we're going to approximate them by taking a Gaussian copula as approximating the joint distribution. Okay, so put D equal to T prime sigma squared I plus V to the minus one. This is just the, if you want to call it the covariance uh, uh, component. Then you can show that the expected value of our ideal data, given our observed data, I call this A over here, is X beta plus uh, a correction term, which depends on this matrix D. And the, similarly, the conditional uh, variance of our ideal data, given our linked data, is this matrix B over here, which is the original sigma squared times an identity matrix. But now there's a correction term here, sigma to the four D times D. And that obviously the conditional distribution we want to work with is Y given Y star. And you can obviously, given A and B, 
And given our Gaussian assumption, we can write that as A plus B times a Gaussian uh, sort of unit, Gaussian vector. Okay, so now let's, how, you, how do you use the MIT to estimate beta? Well, the ideal data score function is a very simple one up here. So the available data score function is the conditional expectation of that ideal data score function given our linked data. We use the conditional model we've just built and we can show that that's now what our actual score function should look like. We can put that equal to zero. We can actually analytically solve for it and we get our MIP base estimator beta star, which it looks like a uh, weighted least squares uh, type uh, of uh, estimator except you've got to remember that this D matrix over here and, as, and the T matrix as well, uh, that D matrix is not diagonal. So one of the problems with this thing is that you can't do sort of, you can't play games with uh, individual weights here. Similarly with sigma squared, the ideal data uh, score function is given by this expression here. And when we take its conditional expectation, given the linked data, you get a slightly bigger, slightly more complex expression over here. And you're going to actually solve that as well analytically. And you get the myth based estimator of sigma squared, which looks like something like our um, sort of uh, sum of squares type estimator plus a correction term over here, which is based on the trace of B. And again, we see that this matrix D comes into the middle of it. Um, so these things work very well. I talked about it in a paper uh, with Denise De Silva uh, in KRSSA. Okay, so right now we're going to go to small area estimation. Now, I know it's a long way to get there, but we're finally there. Okay, let's focus on a random intercept specification. This is the same model uh, as, as Isabel was using. So we have a uh, uh, a linear mix model for our sample values of y. This is, we don't see them, but this is what we believe it is. There is obviously some covariates. There's a matrix Z over here, which effectively uh, allocates uh, observations to areas. We have our area random effects vector U, and we have some individual uh, random effects. This model then says the expectation of y given x and z is just x times beta. And the variance of y given x and z is sigma squared times an identity matrix, sigma squared E, which is our individual variances, uh, variance components, and sigma squared U, which is our area variance component times zz prime. Now, we have a non-informative sample drawn from the link register. We're going to use a ELE model for linkage errors. I'm not going to assume there's any hierarchical structure here. Errors and blocks can intersect. Mm -hmm. Remember, this, these things are independent of one another. So areas and blocks can intersect. Records in different areas, but in the same block, can be incorrectly linked. So the basic assumption of uncorrelated area effects no longer holds for linked sample data. Again, we make the Gaussian copular assumption for the joint distribution of Y and Y star, apply the MIP, uh, and use it to calculate the MLEs for the regression parameter beta and the variance components sigma squared U and sigma squared E. All of this works nicely, except it requires inversion of matrices of order cap n, the population size, which is not really very practical. So we've got to rethink our strategy over here. And so one thing we're doing, oops, a daisy, I shouldn't have done that. Um, let's just go here. Okay, I am now going to, to look not at the joint distribution of the population values of Y and the link sample values of Y, but I'm gonna look at the sample, the true sample values of Y and the link sample values of Y. Now, strictly speaking, the MIP no longer applies, all right? Since Y star S is not contained in Y S, okay? So strictly speaking, but it may be close enough uh, to give us some better uh, estimates and our computational issues are much reduced. Now we only have to invert matrices of order the sample size rather than the population size. So we now crank through the, the MIP machinery. Uh, we get the, the expectation of Y star, variance of Y star, covariance of YS and Y star. And the interesting thing here perhaps is because uh, the um, 
we can get linkage across areas in the same block, we have an extra component of variance denoted by this K matrix over here, which characterizes the extra heterogeneity in Y star due to incorrect linkage of units in the same block, but in different areas. Okay, this is something uh, Samat and I, uh, Clairung Samat and I wrote about some years ago. Okay, again, we have the Gaussian joint distribution assumption. Uh, we have the A and the B, where A is the conditional expectation of the sample values of Y, given the link sample values of Y, and B is the conditional variance of the sample values of Y, given the link sample values of Y. So we, again, it's the same sort of thing. It's almost mechanistic in a way, uh, but you crank it out. Uh, and for example, if you take the fixed effects regression parameter beta, the ideal data score function for that is this expression here under the linear mixed model. The MIP based score function, on the other hand, you take the conditional expectation of that, and it turns out uh, to look slightly more complicated. Uh, and you can actually solve that. And this is what it looks like, beta star here. It's sort of like uh, the uh, weighted estimator you use with a linear mixed model or a random intercepts model, but not quite. It has extra matrices floating around, which are adjusting for the linkage error process. All right, what about the variance components? These are just as interesting. The area level variance component, the ideal data score is given by this expression over here. Um, that will be fine, but we don't know the whys. So we're going to use uh, the, the MIP based score function, uh, the available data score function, take the conditional expectation of that given the data we have, and you get this expression here on this line. Um, we can't solve that for sigma squared, it's nonlinear, so it, but it will have a zero. Uh, it's just we have to uh, get at it uh, numerically. The same thing goes for the unit level variance component, sigma squared E. We have the same sort of idea. We take the ideal data score function, look at its conditional expectation, given the linked data, and then find a zero for this modified score function. What about small area estimation of small area quantities? We only talked about parameters at the moment. Well, we have a Gaussian joint distribution assumption if we look at the random effects for the small area, the vector of random effects for the small area, and our observed linked sample data, they have a joint distribution. So we can actually get the conditional expectation of our random effects uh, vector u given our observed linked data. And that's this expression over here. And I call that uh, u hat. And it's a function of beta, sigma squared u, and sigma squared e. And of course, we can plug in uh, MIP-based MLEs uh, for those parameters. Okay, so when we come down to, say, for example, focusing on I1 uh, estimates for the small area means of Y, then you just literally just look at the standard um, empirical best, empirical bluff um, estimator for, say, the small area mean and area I, uh, that will be the area average of the x's in that in area i times our estimate of beta, which will now be beta star, plus the area average of the z uh, matrices for area i uh, uh, times this, um, this estimate of u hat up here. Um, there's a closely related work. Hiram uh, Samath and I looked at maximizing an approximation to the Gaussian log likelihood under, under ELE. Uh, but we didn't use the MIP for that. It leads to pseudo MLE estimates of linear mixed model parameters. And then Briscolini et al, 2018, they explore a Bayesian approach here, uh, but they focus only where the block and the area are the same thing. Whereas we allow blocks to cross areas, there's no restriction. Okay, so some numbers. Sandbox simulation of SAE under linear mixed model and ELE. Okay, this is a simulation results for 100 independent repetitions of the ELE linkage area scenario. I've got a population size of 20,000, sample size of 1,000. I've got 40 blocks, 40 areas. The blocks are defined independently of the small areas. 
uh, for with the first 10 blocks were perfect in terms of linkage. The next 10 blocks, there was a 5% linkage error. Uh, the next 10 blocks, 10% linkage error. And then the last 10 blocks, 15% linkage error. Uh, independent simple random samples were taken in each of the 40 areas. And because there's no nesting of uh, areas in blocks or blocks and areas, sample sizes vary depending on the area and sample sizes range between five and 40. So we are dealing with small area type problems over here. Okay, so now I'll show you some results for the parameter estimates. Okay, these are the four parameters in my model. These are the true values. And here we have the average over the simulations, the 100 simulations, and that's the root mean squared error over there. The ideal is, of course, if you've got completely correctly linked data. The naive is if you ignore the linkage error and just use standard eBLOP, uh, standard fit a linear mix model with the linked data, ignore the problem of linkage and go and go for it. And then we have the, the method we're proposing, which is based on correcting for the linkage error bias using the missing information principle. Okay, now you can look at the numbers themselves, but I think you can fairly see it easily yourself. Uh, the thing I've highlighted over here is something we expected to see, but it's actually quite large, which is the, uh, if you have linkage error, your estimate of the within uh, area uh, component of variance can be biased upwards to a very large extent. Okay, so it's, we had the true value here was seven. The average value was around about 17 uh, when you actually uh, ignored linkage errors. So here we have some plots, which so essentially the same thing as on, on that table, just a slightly different way of presenting it. So here we have beta naught, the intercept, beta one, our slope parameter, uh, and you can see here linkage, what happens with uh, linkage errors that they uh, bias uh, sort of standard parameter estimates. Uh, so you've got the intercept being biased upwards, uh, the slope being biased downwards. Uh, then you look at your variance components over here, sigma squared u. You can see that that's biased downwards a bit. Uh, and you can see what happens with sigma squared e. It's biased upward a lot. What about the actual small area estimates themselves? These are the uh, average values in each of the small 40 small areas. Uh, this shows you the distribution of area-specific mean squared errors and uh, area-specific mean absolute errors. This is the area-specific mean squared error. These are the area-specific mean absolute errors. These are the ideal uh, uh, sort of uh, values. That means if you had 100% uh, correctly linked data. These are the naive, if you ignore the linkage problem, and here's with the MIP, same across here. You can see that using uh, the MIP, even with all the approximations we've built into it, uh, still helps you out considerably uh, when you're trying to get hold, when you're trying to get, to, trying to get as close as you can to that ideal uh, distribution. One final uh, slide, no idea what the time is. Uh, but if Peter hasn't said anything. Two minutes. Yes. How many minutes? Two. Two minutes. This is perfect. Okay. <laughs> so inclusion of additional population auxiliary information. Um, I've just given you an example where I said we don't know anything about why except the link values. Um, but you could well say that, well, you've got linked a link to a, a linked register. You also know uh, the linked averages of why. And there's no problem with that. You can bring that information across uh, using the missing information principle, bring it in. It just gets messier in terms of notation and you see the same sort of gains as I've just demonstrated. Okay, so very straightforward to extend the Gaussian popular assumption to the joint distribution of Y, Y star and the averages of the Ys. Probably what's more interesting at the moment, at least something I'm working on is area level SAE using linked data. Okay, now traditionally area level small area estimation is based on the classical Fay Harriot approach. That's essentially smoothing of area level direct estimates against area level contextual variables in a way that also allows for the estimation error inherent in the direct estimates. Now that's fine. But if those direct estimates are based on non-deterministic linked data, 
that both the estimation error model or the sampling model and the smoothing model, which is our linking model, all right, which is this is a linking model in the small area context, need to be modified to allow for the extra heterogeneity due to linkage errors. So that essentially requires that you need to do Fay Harriet smoothing at block by area level, not at area level. And that's a current research project I'm working on. Okay, and then finally, here are some references uh, for people who might want to chase up at some stage. Uh, but thank you for listening. Thanks very much. Shall I stop the share? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Um, Done. Any questions for Raymond? This one. one there. We're just getting the microphone to. Hi, Ray, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm Paul Smith from the University of Southampton. Um, so thanks for the talk, which is a nice way of showing how, how you can use uh, linked data to do stuff. If, if I'm not in your wonderful ideal situation where the exchangeable linkage error model holds, but I have a data set, would I be better off using all this nice machinery um, even though the, the LE doesn't hold, or am I better off just doing the naive small area estimation I would do anyway? Good point, Paul. Um, I, I'd sort of cast in a slightly different way. You are, I'm still well aware uh, that most people, when they analyze a survey data, take a set of weights, okay, so sample weights, uh, and maybe some cluster definitions, and just throw them in and just use standard weighted least squares. Uh, with some sort of cluster type variances. You know, you know basically that. All right. The ELE model is no different from that idea. Uh, no, no one in their right mind believes uh, that the, the model underpinning, uh, if you want to call it uh, uh, weighted least squares or probability inverse weighted least squares is actually the true model. Okay. But you use it because it works well and it's easy to program. The same thing with the ELE. It's a convenient, and I'm, I'm not saying it's a, it's a convenient model, uh, you, it obviously depends on how you define your blocks. If you are concerned, then you obviously got to be very careful how you set up your blocking specification, uh, and then it should work reasonably well. Um, to do anything else requires you at some stage you're going to have to model the linkage process. Uh, if you don't, I don't think it takes very much linkage error to throw you out quite a lot. I'm not, not, not necessarily in the context of things like, like regression coefficients, but as we just demonstrated in the context of things like variance components, it can throw you out quite a lot. And that, of course, then throws in, goes into... Um, into thanks very much. Um, thanks very much also for the invitation to, to come and talk here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, unit level small area models for skewed business survey kind of data. This is some work I've been doing with uh, Chiara Bocci from University of Florence, who's done a lot of hard work behind this, so big shout out for her as well. I'll start off by talking a little bit about the characteristics of business surveys uh, and how those influence what we do for small area estimation. And we'll look at some unit level modelling strategies uh, for making small area estimations with business survey data. We did a bit of previous research which has been published, uh, which is using uh, an administrative database population from uh, the Netherlands, which we used to investigate uh, different robust estimation approaches to small area estimation. So I'll talk you through that bit. Um, that Dutch data was made available for a specific purpose, so we didn't, don't any longer have access to it. So now we've moved on to a new population uh, based on Italian retail uh, business population. So we'll look at the, the Italian data, look at the repeatability of the robust estimation that we did with the Dutch data, and then some extension to transformation-based results, uh, and then I'll have a few conclusions for you. Um, so business surveys are a bit weird for uh, small area estimation. They have some characteristics that make it quite difficult, in particular that the populations are skewed. So there's there's often a, a long right tail of um, a few really large businesses. And all those models that we've been talking about already this morning uh, have these assumptions hiding underneath that say, and my errors are normally distributed. So if I've got this skewed data that's coming in in the first place, I'm pretty sure already that my errors aren't normally distributed. So what can I do about that to make things better? 
On the other hand, uh, um, business surveys do have some really nice features that make life a little bit easier. So I've often got a business register derived from some sources, whether it's tax data, admin data, something, but there is a, a list of all the businesses that are out there that I'm interested in with some information about um, what size a business has, some auxiliary information that I can use in my model. So those bits of uh, extra information make the small area process a little bit easier. There are not that many examples out there of people having done small area estimation with business survey data. There are some, uh, if you go and look in the literature, but it's not a huge number relative to the number of applications on uh, lots of other types of data that are based on human populations or poverty or all those things. And the reason is those skewed variables that I already mentioned, that business surveys often have quite detailed stratification um, in order to uh, make sure that we cover in the design all the right kinds of businesses. So we have some businesses that are always included uh, and some businesses that uh, have low selection probabilities. And those detailed strata lead to non-negligible sampling fractions. So some of those sampling fractions are really quite large, close to one, sometimes they are one. Uh, and that means that we have an informative sample. So those weights, though, those sampling fractions turned into weights uh, are really important uh, in the model fitting. And generally in those kinds of uh, multi-level models that we use for um, small area estimation, uh, we quietly ignore the weights or we stick them in, as Isabel talked about in some of those uh, nice estimators. So we'll see in this talk, some estimators with weights and some estimators without weights and we'll see what effect those have. Um, I have quite a lot of unit level modeling strategies that I could use for business surveys. Um, so at a, a simplistic level, I can start off with just the standard multi-level model um, that uh, Isabel and Ray both showed in their presentations with the uh, empirical best linear unbiased predictor. Um, um, but I kind of expect that that isn't gonna work very well because of all those funny skewed distribution characteristics, the more ignorable sampling, all of those things. So I could just, uh, apply naively what we always do and see how it comes out and I kind of expect it won't work very well. Um, I can do some transformations so I could transform my data so that it's no longer has these long tails uh, and then um, use the transform data in small area estimation. If I use the standard uh, logarithmic transformation that we would often have in business survey data uh, then I can um, you know, work with that if I then make my estimation on that scale, then I have to have a bias correction as I come backwards, as I uh, undo the transformation. You're shaking your head at me, so you can ask me questions later when it doesn't work. <laughs> I've got several of those that. We can also look at some data-driven transformations. So we, we might not want to stick only to a logarithmic transformation, but we might want to do something um, that's a bit more attuned to the data. So rather than just uh, automatically applying a log transformation and cracking the handle, I might want a different transformation that's a bit more attuned to the data set that I've got. So we'll look at some transformations a little bit later. Um, the work that we already did that's published in this paper that's hence here uh, was using some robust models. So instead of um, dealing with the, the long tail in the distribution by transforming, I could say that all those things that are in the tail uh, are affecting how I make my modeling. So let's treat those in some way by reducing their influence on the model. And there are several of those. Uh, there's M regression, uh, which gives me a, a robust synthetic estimator. <coughs> More on these in a, a slide or two. There's M quantile regression. Um, and there are different versions of that one. There's a, a robust projective or a naive version. And that basically says, let me trim off the, the unusual observations, the outliers in my distribution. Uh, and then I'm just going to use that fitted model to estimate for everything. So that kind of assumes that in the bit that I didn't sample, um, there won't be any outliers because I haven't used those in my model at all. And there's a second group, which is the robust predictive ones, which say, well, actually, I kind of know that there must be some outliers in that bit that I didn't sample. So let me put something in there as well. And we'll, we'll see how those uh, estimators work out. And then there's a, uh, a fourth strategy. Um, which I won't talk about today, uh, which is to introduce those models with non-normal errors. Uh, 
which Isabel talked about at the end. So one of those is a generalized beta GV2, one's a skew normal, one other option is a mixture of normal distributions, and there are some further potential approaches after that. So that's some stuff that we'll get to uh, in our research later. I have this um, non-ignorable sampling. So the, those uh, sampling fractions are important for, for telling me what's going on in my business survey, which means the weights are important. Um, so I've got two broad strategies for how to do that, and there may be some more as well. But I can certainly include in my models the variables which uh, tell me what the selection probabilities are. So if I include information about the size strata or the industry strata in my model, that should take account of uh, the, the kind of information that would be included in the weights. So that might help me to, to deal with this non-ignorable sampling. Or I can include the weights directly in the model. So the weights clearly have information on what's going on in there. So we'll see versions of those uh, going on in here. So we started out uh, in this particular uh, analysis with some Dutch structural business survey data. Um, so it's an example data set that tries to replicate the structural business survey. That's the big annual survey that collects lots of information on uh, anything you ever wanted to know about businesses. Mm, do I want to do that? Well, uh, I suspect. Do, do. do I? Yes. Right. <laughs> and then we have to go back to go back to where I was. Right. Um, so we have the, the Dutch tax data for the retail industry, uh, and we try to replicate something that looks like the structural business survey with that data. So we're in the retail industry. Um, I said that there weren't that many uh, applications of small area in business surveys. We'll find that if you look hard, most of the ones that there are are in retail. The reason being that there are generally quite a lot of retail businesses. Um, whereas if you were doing something like shipbuilding, there might be a really small number. So retail is, is a, an industry where we kind of expect that small area might work best. In this particular example, um, we're excluding the largest businesses. So the ones that are um, uh, so important in a UK context, you might think about Tesco's. Got to have Tesco's in because uh, otherwise you, you miss such a large amount and there's no way to predict it. So we're assuming that there's a group of those really large businesses which have been uh, sampled with uh, probability one. So they're always included. We know everything there is to know about those, so we don't have to do any estimation in a small area way. So I'm going to exclude those largest businesses from what I've got here. But even amongst the, the slightly smaller businesses that, that remain in my data set, I have some strata which are completely enumerated. So they do have an impact. There were two years of tax data to start with. So there was year one, which we're going to treat as if it's a, a register. Um, so that's like my business register. It provides some information, some auxiliary information that means I can design a sample with that data that looks like a structural business survey. And it gives me auxiliary information, information about those different businesses, which I can use for the, the small area model fitting. And then I have my second year of tax data, which I'm going to treat as if it's the survey responses. So uh, I can go out conceptually um, to any of the businesses in year two uh, and collect conceptually the information. Because I have that from tax, uh, the whole population is known. So then I can select repeatedly different samples, all with the same uh, structural business survey design, uh, and redo each time um, the, the small area estimation stuff, and then assess against the real values from the whole population uh, how well I'm doing. So the, the, the advantage of using this tax data is that I know the outcome. So what I'm trying to see is how well do these small area estimation approaches work if I'm using this survey data. Um, here we go with the estimators. So um, I'll just talk you through those so we've got a bit more feel for how those go. So I can start off uh, on the left hand side with direct estimators. So I can just use the survey weights, which is the classical orbits Thompson estimator, uh, and make domain estimation for whatever I want. And in this particular example, I'm going to estimate as my small areas each of the separate industries within retailing. So I can do that with just the weights. 
Um, I can use a model assisted approach where I have a Greg, a generalized regression estimator. Uh, and in the Dutch case, uh, the model there was based on information on tax uh, on the register as it was. So that was my first year's worth of tax data and the industrial classification and then two size classes, one that's 0 to 9 employment and one that's 10 to 14 employment. So neither of those are small area. Both of those only use the, the Horvitz Thompson and the Greg, both use just the information inside the industry that I'm interested in to make estimates for that industry. Because the sample sizes are a bit small, those are uh, going to have large variances and therefore I'd really like to do some small area estimation. The outcome you're looking at here is employment or GBA? No, or the, 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 yeah, the outcome is the tax uh, the turnover in turnover. year two. Yes. So it's turnover is what I'm trying to estimate. Sorry, should have said that. The indirect estimators. So I can fit that classical multi-level model that we've seen several times over, which has an X beta bit, uh, which is the fixed effects, and Z times U, which is the random effects. Uh, and those little e's, which are the individual level effects for individual businesses. And the e up, the one underneath, is just the classical approach that I would apply if I wasn't worried about all those skewed distributions and everything else. So that's kind of the, the naive approach. And then the model that I've got uh, that fits in all of these indirect estimators that are coming on, on this slide and ones that come later is one that uh, relates TTO, which is turnover, uh, which is my, my proxy value from the tax in the second year. And it relates that to tax in the first year, which is tax one, SC, which is the size class, WP, which is working persons. Um, it's a little bit funny to have both the size class based on working uh, working people and the working persons variable, but that's how the Dutch do their Greg. So we did it that way uh, in this bit. And then there's this interaction at the end, which is tax one times WP. So we've got several predictors in there, which allow us to, to get them. And we use the same model as the basis for each one. In my repeated sampling, I can have, just have a look at some diagnostic plots to see what's going on. Um, so if I look here in the top right, uh, those are the residuals up there. Uh, and you can see that they're kind of scattered around a line that's zero, but there are these uh, real outliers uh, that are away from the, the, the zero line. Some of them up in the top corner look as if they're a long way away. So I've clearly got a long tail of something that's going on that's not fitting very well in my model. And I can look at the QQ plots. I've got two in here. I've got one for the individual level, which is the one on the left hand side in the bottom. And that's clearly not uh, a straight line. So there, there really is some, some real impact in here of the, the skewness in the business survey variables that's affecting that. The one in the right hand corner at the bottom is the, um, the QQ plot for the uh, industry level effects that I'm trying to estimate. And I might wave my hands and say that's not too far off a straight line. So it looks like um, the, the, the industry level uh, estimation is not too affected by the skew, but definitely the individual level bit is. So I really ought to do something. I, I shouldn't just take this model as it is. And that's just one of the repeated samples. So I could do this for one of the no quite a Thank you. Sorry, yeah, uh, you go. Yeah. I mean, with you that you need to account for skewness, but IBLA does not require normality. Doesn't require a normality. Okay. IBLA does not require normality. Okay. But it is true that yeah, it, results will not be nice. So right. -o. It's a it's a matter of robustness. Yes. So I then have this series of alternative estimators that I can try to, to, to deal with this skewness that I need to do something. So uh, I'll talk my way through all those that I manage. And, uh, so I've got a robust EBLOP, um, which is based on some work by Senior Rao in 2009. So I can say those, those um, observations that have big residuals are clearly having quite an impact on my model. So let's uh, reduce the impact of those that would have big residuals. So I can use a, a Huber function to make the residuals smaller and build that into the model. Um, the Huber function requires a tuning constant. And there's a classical bit that says, uh, if your errors are normally distributed, you use a tuning constant that says 1.345. Only I know my errors aren't normally distributed really. So should I use that constant? You can ask me about that one at the end. Um, 
So well, I am going to use that just because it's the way that people always do it, because that's what Huber said when he worked it out at the beginning. So even though it doesn't really uh, match with my data set, I'm going to carry on with that tuning constant. So then the Huber function reduces the impact of those large residuals on the estimates of the betas and of the u's. Um, so I can plug that in and I get this uh, robust EBLUF. When I fit that with this Dutch data set, I find that the industry level effect is almost zero. So in fact, when I use the robust EBLUP, uh, I don't any longer need the multi-level model at all. So that seems as if it doesn't really gel with the, uh, the way I think my data structure works. So we don't use the robust EBLUP going on in here. Um, Instead, we can think about pseudo EBLUP, uh, which comes from a paper by Ewan Rao and some recent work by uh, Enrico Fabrizzi and some others. Uh, and that plugs in the weights. So now I'm going to take the EBLUP, plug in the weights that I've got from my survey, uh, and then crank the handle. And that gives me a, a different uh, estimate of the betas, which I can then use uh, in my small area estimation approach. I have M estimation. Uh, which uh, is a, a robust way uh, to, to estimate the betas uh, based on the median. Uh, and that gives me another version of the beta hat, which I can then plug in to estimate. So I've got a, a version there which has the, the observed Ys plus an estimate for the bits that I don't get and for all the bits that I want. And I use the, this robust estimator beta hat uh, in M, the M estimator. Uh, I've got some more robust projected ones. These are the ones that, that don't uh, account for the, the outliers that are in the, the bit of data that I didn't see. So I can then use an M quantile estimator. So uh, the M estimator is the median. M quantile is trying to estimate a quantile that's not necessarily the median. We can go across all of the, the different quantiles here. So first I try and define a Q, a quantile, in such a way that um, my observed Ys are equal to XI transpose, uh, the auxiliary information, times this estimator beta hat QI. So I define a Q value for every single observation in my data set, saying where it is in amongst uh, the quantiles of the fitting distribution. And then in each domain, I find the mean of those Qs, and then I use that mean, uh, to, uh, the, the betas that correspond with that uh, mean value of Q as my uh, parameters to make an estimate. So I've got yet another version of the betas in there, which is this beta Q hat, uh, Q bar, sorry. Now, we call that one a naive M quantile estimator, uh, and it's actually inconsistent. So uh, as the sample size gets larger, it doesn't necessarily converge to the right thing. So we're a little bit worried that it doesn't have that, that consistency property. But there is a version um, which I have, which has a bias correction and is consistent, and that's based on some work by Chambers and Dunstan in 1986, going back a little bit. Um, so it has this extra correction term, and now we do have a consistent estimator. Are you still with me? Fantastic. Now onto the robust predictive estimator. So now I am going to deal with the ones that account for there might be a bit of outliers left in the bit that I didn't observe, so I ought to do something about those. So now I can stick again with my M quantile estimator, but now I can add on a, an extra bit, which is this last term over here on the right hand side. Um, so that extra bit uh, is adding back some of the, uh, the, the, uh, the outliers that are going on, but I still have a Huber function and now I've got this phi instead of a psi. So I've got two different Huber functions uh, um, working in the same way. So the second Huber function is basically removing some of the outlier in, um, that I got from the, the first fit, but not all of it. And the general idea is that the, this second Huber function uh, has a parameter which should code the bias variance trade-off. And I expect the parameter to be a bit um, larger than it was for the first Huber function. So I set my first one to 1.345. The second one I expect to have um, a beta psi uh, beta phi, sorry, I'm wrong way around. A uh, beta phi, which is bigger than that original 
Right, I hope you kept up with all of that. So this is uh, the original stuff with the, the Netherlands tax data. Uh, and now I'm looking at the relative root mean squared errors of those industry estimates that I'm making with all those estimators that I just described for you. Um, so I can look right at the top is the Horvitz Thompson estimator, the one that I get if I just use the survey weights. Uh, and we can see that that's uh, got quite large relative uh, root in squared errors. The Greg that's underneath it, the second row down, actually doesn't look too bad in this case. It's doing quite well with those things. Um, the EBLUP I kind of knew wasn't going to do very well because that's um, not accounting for this skewed distribution of my data and it doesn't. Uh, and I could look at quite a few of the other things. Um, the one that looks immediately quite good in there is the M quantile estimator, that one that says M. Uh, that's got quite small relative root mean squared errors uh, and not many outlines, uh, not many outlying root mean squared errors for particular industries. Um, remember that was the one that's not consistent, what I was a bit worried about, but it seems like empirically at least in, in this data set that it's working quite well. The one underneath it, the MQCD, is the one that's got the bias correction and is consistent and that's not doing very well at all. Um, but then if I go to the ones that are allowing in those outliers, that's the MQWR ones, and there are three versions there with different values of B5, uh, uh, you can see that they actually do quite well. And the weighted estimator does quite well in this data set as well. The EBLA goes with, uh, without any transformation. Without any transformation. Any transformation. Why, uh, why didn't you transform the data and apply EB? EB. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. Don't panic. Don't panic. <laughs> so the, 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 the impression to get from here is that if you apply those robust methods, uh, you can do quite a lot better. You have to pick the right one. And that MQWR one with the second tuning constant, um, if I can kind of pick the, the one that works best, and it's actually the B5 equals 1 in this case, is the best of all of the ones that's here. If I knew that B5 was 1, and plug that in, then I do best with that one, but only just better than the MQ estimator. So it's probably not really worth it, and I would actually have to estimate B5 from somewhere. Right, so that was the Dutch data. Now that was a made available for a specific research project that we managed to make a publication on, but then we weren't allowed to use it anymore. So then we want to go on a little bit further to look at some other things. Um, so I need an alternative source of data and it has to be population data so that I can actually evaluate how well everything's doing. So there's fortunately this nice database called AIDA from Bureau van Dijk, which is a multi-year database of Italian businesses. So we extract a similar set of data from there, which is retail businesses in Italy, excluding petrol stations because they have this terrible structure. Um, don't go there. Okay. We'll, we'll just leave them out. Uh, so I've got the same principle. I have a stratified design. We've done some name and allocation with some constraints to make sure that we get enough businesses in each stratum based on auxiliary information from the 2018 uh, version of AIDA. We have a sample size of 3,635, which is a nice round number because we originally did it with the petrol stations in, um, but it doesn't matter particularly. The sample size could be kind of anything. And then we'll use the realized values from 2020 as the survey values for my uh, repeated sampling exercise. Um, so what are we going to do with this data? So the story goes on. I'd like to uh, assess those same robust estimation approaches that we just looked at in the Dutch data on a second data set. So am I going to get the same answers if I do it again? Um, and then we'd like to look at some of those transformation based approaches as well. And the question that I'm ultimately trying to get to, and I won't even quite get to the end today, um, is faced with a new business survey data set and the requirement to do small area estimation, what approach shall I use? Um, so first of all, let's take exactly the graph that we just had, uh, but now with the IEDA data. Uh, this has uh, qualitatively at least the same pattern for everything that's going on. So the, the direct estimator's got quite large mean squared errors. The Greg doesn't do so well in this particular case. Um, but the M quantile estimator uh, is again about the best. In fact, it is the best in this case. It's slightly better even than the one with those uh, outliers plugged back in. The weighted versions do quite well in this particular data set, slightly better than they did 
uh, in the, um, the original Dutch one. But basically, the pattern of things that are going on in here is the same. So I'm reassured, at least I get the same answer when I do these things twice. Now I've got a new data set, I can go on a little bit further and think about what else shall I do. Um, so uh, let me go back a step. So I kind of launched in the, the middle of my uh, different options uh, by looking at those uh, estimators that deal with outliers, the robust ones. Now I'm going to go back and think about the transformation based ones, which was the first category of stuff. So empirical best prediction, the EB, uh, P approach, uh, based on Isabel and uh, John Rao's paper, as she explained earlier, which is very helpful for me. Um, so that's that's been investigated a bit more recently by Rojas Perea uh, and others in a paper uh, where they look at different set of transformations. So the idea of empirical best prediction approach is that you generate some transformed data Y star, um, you use, uh, so you transform your data to get Y star. You use the Y stars to fit a multi-level model and take estimates of the parameter, generate pseudo populations from the original data by repeated sampling of the residuals from the model, back transform those values to give you a, a new pseudo population, then calculate your mm -hmm. estimator, your indicator uh, in each of the pseudo populations and average those to get pseudo population indicators. Um, I can look at a series of different transformations in the EVP as well. So I can do linear, which is no transformation at all, and just see what happens. I can use the classical log transformation. Um, I probably have to add something onto my values because uh, a log of zero isn't a very good value. So and I do have some zeros in my data set. So um, in fact, we can choose S here uh, in different ways where you can um, have a deterministic choice example one, which is um, kind of what you would do if you weren't thinking very strongly, you could make S just enough to make the, the value a, a little bit uh, um, above zero, but that's not effective because you get outliers from things that are too small. Um, you can actually fit this as well. So the, the log shift transformation uh, is now it's just the same here, but I've got a lambda in it instead of an S. And the lambda is something that I can fit, whereas the S is something that I have to assume or provide. So we'll look at what happens if you fit the lambdas. I can then use uh, another alternative, which is the box Cox transformation, uh, which has been around for a long time. Um, so this is uh, driven again by a parameter lambda. You also need to make sure all your values are positive. So I still need this S coming in from somewhere. Uh, and if I chose um, lambda equal to zero, my notes go, then I'd end up with the log. And if I choose lambda equal to one, now I'm just doing a, a shift uh, only. So it's kind of allowing me to, to flip between uh, the log version and the shift version uh, according to this parameter that I fit, which is the lambda. Box Cox transformation is actually bounded uh, away from zero. So uh, there, there's some thought that uh, in some cases it might not work as well as it could. So there's a, an alternative version of the thing called the dual power transformation. Thank you. Um, which uh, isn't bounded, and I can use that one as well. I might have to go slightly quicker and we can get to the end here. Then I've got some transformation type estimators. So I've got uh, now uh, the, the EB um, stuff all works by creating a new population, doing the estimation uh, with the, uh, the series of populations. All these transformation estimators are models fitted on the transform data, and then you have to back transform with a bias correction. So I've got a, a synthetic predictor, uh, which comes from Chandran Chambers 2011. Uh, let's not go too far there. It's got some correction into the bias. There's a model-based direct version, which tries to get there using a set of weights to correct for uh, the, um, uh, the bias as well. And then I have two others. I have an empirical best predictor um, developed specifically on uh, log transform data on Berg and Chandra. Uh, and then I have a bias corrected version of that one as well. So let's not go too much through all this. I've got essentially the same model uh, that we had for the Dutch data, but now I'm only using the size variable and not the size class variable. And I've got two versions of it. I've got one where I use the turnover from 2018, that's the auxiliary variable in my register. Um, and there's a second version where I use the log of the turnover in the register. So then I can look at the, um, 
the, the uh, relative root mean squared errors for the empirical best predictors. Um, for, I've given you a, a few industries there to see the kind of patterns that I get uh, and the medians and the means at the bottom across all of the industries. And you can see that uh, the, the log and the log shift do make things a bit better than just using the linear estimator in most of the industries that I've got here, but sometimes they blow up. Uh, so particularly for 4752, industry 4752, they're not great. But the box cocks and the dual power ones are actually doing better, except for industry 4752, where actually the one with no transformation at all seems to work best. I've shown that one, but actually it's the only one in my whole data set where it's like that. So in general, the linear one doesn't work very well. Why it should be okay for that industry, we haven't checked out yet. If I use a model with log x instead of, uh, so it's the log of the turnover two years ago, uh, instead of the turnover value itself, I do quite a lot better with all of those models. Um, so in general, the log and the log shift are now behaving themselves. Box cocks and the dual power still do better on average uh, than the log and the log shift, but there's not lots in it here. Um, so all of those seem to be working reasonably well. I could look at the relative biases. So this is bias now, not mean squared error. It's the only bias plot in my whole presentation. So the, the Horvitz-Thompson at the top is, is practically unbiased. The E bluff is badly negatively biased. So is the EVP that's linear and the linear model at the top of the next panel as well. Um, when I use the, uh, the uh, transformations, uh, life gets a bit better. Um, so the, this panel here, um, all of those seem to be a bit positively biased after I've done something. So that's all the uh, empirical best predictors with the uh, x variable instead of the log x variable. And when I use log x, which is the one that's lower down, it looks like the bias is kind of all right because um, that's all centered close to zero. And I could also look at the uh, root mean squared errors of those different estimates. Um, so I can see here actually that the um, the the transformed versions uh, here in the third panel down uh, are actually doing really quite well. So with that log x model, uh, and so is uh, the, the set underneath. There are some good ones in, in all of those uh, models that are there. Uh, so the log and the log shift uh, are the ones with the smallest overall mean squared errors here. Uh, the box cocks and the dual power ones are slightly better overall with log x. Um, because they have narrower distributions of the relative root mean squared errors. I'm still clearly doing quite well with those. So now back to where I was. Let me uh, uh, put together the, the information that I just get from these um, nice transformation based models and compare those with the, the relative root mean squared errors that I got from the robust models in the first place. So the three columns on the left of my table, the log, the dual power and the EB predictor with bias correction. Those are the best ones from all those transformation type estimators. And you can see that the median and mean relative root mean squared errors are quite similar to each other, but around 13, 14, 50. And then if I use the, the robust ones, the ones that I started out with with my presentation, all those relative root mean squared errors are quite a lot smaller. So it looks from this so far as if the robust versions are, are gonna um, outperform the transformation based versions which is quite interesting, um, particularly quite interesting because the robust model doesn't have the log x's in it, it just has the x's. So even with that, it seems that the, uh, the robust approach is, is the, the best one for the for small area estimation for business surveys as we are. So what do I conclude? The results from the simulations with the Dutch data uh, that we've already had seem to be corroborated with the Italian data, data, data set. So I conclude that we have reasonably robust assessment to the different data sources uh, of the, um, the, the conclusions about which estimators work well. Those transformation based approaches that I've been using are effective at making the estimates better, but they're not as good as the best robust models that I've got. Um, yes. Uh, next, um, in fact, you've seen part of what it says on the next because I've supplemented already the EV approach with a direct estimation on the log scale, but there are some more of those for us to tackle. Um, so there will be a little bit of extension to, to what's going on here. Uh, and then there's a, a third group of estimators that I mentioned right at the beginning of the presentation, which is 
those models that uh, directly try to estimate with non-normal errors in the first place. And we plan to, to do a series of simulations again with the same data set so that we can compare those with the ones that we've got here. Uh, and now I shall advertise a little bit. So come to the International Conference on Establishment Statistics. Establishment Statistics is code for businesses, institutions, schools, hospitals, those kinds of things. You need to word, which means all of those bits. So ICES 7 is in Glasgow in June next year. And there is a session on small area estimation for business surveys uh, in which we will try and present some of the stuff on normal, on normal errors to go with all the bits that are here. Those are some references. That's it. One, two questions for the break. Thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting. Um, one of the few talks that include diagnostic plots. <laughs> yeah, that's very really important. And um, um, so the choice of transformation, I mean, you have uh, several approaches, as you mentioned in your talk very well. Uh, uh, when you have a skewness, um, either you transform the data and use uh, normality, but then you need to transform uh, in a way that you get approximate normality. So you need to check uh, that the transformation is correct. So I think the transformation should be chosen also uh, looking at diagnostics, at moment diagnostics. Then another approach is robust uh, procedures, which uh, you don't need to care about transformation, that's okay. Uh, but then um, typically uh, they are either slightly biased or you lose efficiency if you can do it uh, with respect to a parametric model that, uh, that fits well, okay? <laughs> so it's a way of not uh, it, not worrying about finding the transformation, or you can also use uh, more general distributions, more general families of distributions, as you mentioned, uh, like the GB2 or family or uh, mixtures of normals, which uh, cover uh, many different types of distributions. Um, so <laughs> so uh, uh, what I wanted to uh, emphasize is uh, that thing that the transformation need to be chosen uh, and also looking at model diagnostics. Okay, and, uh, and so uh, and the constants that is adding in the box box uh, transformation is not only for achieving uh, positive uh, positive value. It's part of the transformation, and it's important for having for obtaining approximate normality. A constant is very important. Uh, yeah. Um, so if you can find, and you know, there always exists a transformation. Uh, to reach normality. It exists. The only problem is finding it, <laughs> okay? Because the true transformation depends on the true distribution of your data, which you don't know. That's the only problem. So the, the problem is finding it. But if you can find it, uh, uh, specifying the distribution uh, usually leads to greater gains in efficiency. So that's what I but I, I, I love, like your talk a lot. And uh, uh, it's a, another possibility is to apply uh, robust procedures that will perform well uh, in some, without taking care of the, of, of the distribution of transformations. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that, uh, just a couple of um, thoughts and reactions. Yeah, so we didn't just blindly um, apply these transformations. We did look to see what effect it has. And it's a little bit interesting because it's not, you transform the, the original data, but the bit that you want to be normally distributed, if you like, or approximately normal, is the residuals. It's not the, the data itself. Yeah. Um, so it's not quite so clear always the, the link between the transformation you have and what you do with the residuals. Um, but we did look at those and we uh, have applied a couple of versions of, of S in here 
um, which are part of the transformation. But we have in, in the back of our minds already to try a grid of those S values and see how well they work out. Um, apart from this, uh, the, the, the fitted version with the, the lambdas here, it's not quite so obvious how you would choose S even in this context. Um, so that is part of where we're aiming to go. The, the, the more we try, and we started off this as a, as a, a, a little project to write some stuff. And the, the more we go, the more the, um, tendrils it has. So there's S's over there, and, and then there's the tuning constant over here, and there's another bit over there. And the, the number of variations keeps getting bigger and bigger. But I hope that at the end of this process, uh, we'll end up with a at least a not quite a recipe book, but, but some guidance that says, here's the range of models that you might think about, and these are the ones that seem to work, which is kind of where I want to go. And it doesn't seem to be anything like that out there at the moment. We're now uh, eating into um, break time. So this is like a really quick question.